Hi everyone, I'm thriller author J.F. Penn and today I'm here with Anya Lipska. Hi Anya. Hi. (laughs) <laughs> it's good to have you on the show. Just Thanks. a little introduction. So Anya is the best-selling author of the Kishka and Kershaw crime thriller series set in the underworld of London's Polish community, uh, which is what we're talking about today. So Anya, tell us a little bit about A Devil Under the Skin, your latest book, and also about the series in general. Okay, well, starting off uh, d- describing the series, my main character is a guy called Janusz Kiszka. Get your pronunciation right to start with. And he's, uh, a, he's a Pole, born in Poland, but he came over to London in the 80s when Poland was still under communism. Mm-hmm. And he came over to escape from that. And older viewers will recall the, the solidarity years when Poles were fighting for their freedom. He was caught up in all that. He had some terrible experiences. And he came to London, like many did, in the 80s. And um, he did various jobs, the building trade and, you know, all that sort of thing, casual work. And eventually he became a kind of private eye, come tough guy, come fixer, sorting things out for the Polish community in London. Um, And that's a community that has grown hugely in the last few years. So it seemed a good place in which to set a a, a detective thriller series, if you like, because in 2004, we got quite a big influx of Poles in the UK when Poland joined the EU. And he has a kind of ambivalent attitude to this new influx. On the one hand, he absolutely loves the fact that he can buy kielbasa, Polish sausage, and uh, all his favourite treats in the Polsky skleps that are popping up on every street corner in the East End. On the other hand, he used to be an exotic rarity, and now he's just, you know, one of the crowd. He's a kind of, he's another immigrant, and he finds that a bit dif- difficult to cope with. Mm. And so, um, what about Kershaw? Yeah, she's my second character. I thought it was important to have a a British character through which we could kind of view the the, the Polish, the slight strangeness to the UK audience of of Poles and what they're about and this different culture and history. So she's a kind of sharp-elbowed, very ambitious, uh, young female uh, detective who's a, a born and bred East Ender, a Cockney, and it, the the whole series really is about their shifting relationship. When she first comes up against him, she thinks he's a he is a suspect in a murder case, and she goes, you know, typical dodgy Eastern European. He's probably a gangster, but then she goes to his flat, and he has quite a nice flat because he bought it in a nice part of London when London was cheap way back, and. Um, He's cooking jam, you know, and she just doesn't get it because he's, you know, he's a kind of actually an educated guy, even though he's a big, tough, uh, big, rough, tough, brick outhouse kind of looking guy. He's also got this very sensitive side. So I guess the series is that they come, they come into contact with each other during various investigations. Sometimes he's asking for her help with an investigation, and sometimes she needs his help with an investigation that might impact on the have something to do with the Polish community or the East wider Eastern European community in the East End of London. Um, so it's about how they're it's also about how you know obviously it's fast paced thrillers I hope with a lot of humour um, in which people learn a bit about the Polish community in London but also there's this kind of growing relationship between them they're kind of antagonists but then they have this kind of uneasy alliance and by book three they're sort of becoming friends. Mm. And so give us a bit of an overview of, of A Devil Under the Skin. Well, The Devil Under the Skin is book three in the series, and it finds Janusz at uh, Janusz Kiszka at a very important time in his life. He's a guy in his 40s. He's got a wife and a kid back in Poland, a bit of a disastrous marriage, although he stays in touch with his kid and looks after him, of course, because he's an honourable man. Um, but he has had his main relationship in the UK has been with a married woman. Uh, a Polish woman, um, but she has agreed to overcome her, she's a ca- devout Catholic, and she's finally agreed to overcome her reservations and to leave her husband uh, in, you know, in opposition to her, the advice of her priest and everything. And, and here's a guy who's lived on his own for 
20 years and he's you know he's a little bit freaked out about this and his best mate Oscar who's sort of a, he's kind of comedy sidekick if you like is just taking the mick out of him for what it's going to be like and he's a little bit uncertain but broadly speaking he's pretty excited to be starting again at 45 or so and then terrible disaster strikes Kasha his girlfriend goes missing and he becomes convinced that her ne'er-do-well cockney husband uh, has kidnapped her because he too has disappeared as he begins to investigate he finds that that is not quite what it seems there's a lot more going on and it's something that gets entangling with uh, East End gangsters and with gangsters of another extraction uh, that I won't won't give away but soon enough there are bodies all over the place and in the process of this I should have said he's asked he asks for help from his kind of almost mate uh, Natalie Kershaw to try and help find find his girlfriend because she has the resources obviously as a cop and so she kind of she really shouldn't be doing it she's kind of freelancing and using the police computer when she shouldn't be but she's trying to help him out but eventually you know that becomes a bit of an issue Mm. Oh, sounds interesting. So, of course, people listening to your voice would be like, uh, what is this Polish connection? Because you're clearly not, well, you're not Polish. But um, uh, tell us why why Poland, why Polish community? Yeah, well, what happened was about when I started, when I wanted to write a crime book, I decided that's, that's what I wanted to write. About five years ago, I thought, well, OK, I want to set it in East London. That's where I live, in lovely East London, but it's also very gritty. You know, there's a lot going on here. There's a lot of crime. Uh, I thought, well, how am I going to make that different? There's lots of crime books set in London, lots of detective thrillers set in London. And then I realized the answer was kind of staring me in the face because my husband is Polish and was born over there and came over here in the 80s uh, during the solidarity years when Poland was communist. And so I had a kind of great in to the history and culture, and I thought, well, that actually be a great idea for a character, someone who's come here with an awful lot of baggage, who's passed, cast this giant shadow, but a man with, a, you know, I wanted to be a man with a passionate connection to justice, but also quite anti-authoritarian because you don't trust the cops in a communist state. Mm-hmm. So I thought he's going to be a great in for me. And also at the same time, it was a happy coincidence that uh, the polls had started coming into London in quite big numbers. So as I said, there were Polsky shops and, um, you know, everyone knows a poll now, whether it's just as a, you know, their builder or but their kids might go to school with polls. It's become part of the kind of fabric of cities, certainly in the UK. So I thought, well, I love to read books where I learn something about something I didn't know. And I guess a lot of people share that with me. So this seemed like a a great opportunity. People might want to know about the the polls that are coming in and that they're working alongside and shopping alongside. You know, what's it all about? What's their history? What's their culture? They were behind the Iron Curtain for so long that we've kind of become separated from them. Mm. So um, what are some of the places in Poland that come up in the story that people might like to to hear about? Mm. Well, yeah, although the books are set in London, Janusz does from time to time uh, have to go back to Poland to pursue various lines of investigation. And that means that I had the, the, the chance to go on holiday there as well, which has been <laughs> great. And great for my husband too, who goes as my translator. Uh, uh, I think uh, everyone knows Krakow, I hope, which is the great capital city. Well, Warsaw's the, the capital city, but Krakow's the kind of historical city. Very beautiful place, Vavil Castle, very pretty, uh, Quite t- becoming quite touristy now with visitors from all over Europe. But the great thing about Poland is that wherever you go, there's this extraordinary history. So in, uh, in Krakow, it's it's a, a, an older history, perhaps, with, as I say, the castle and this beautiful Habsburgian architecture. But always close by hand, there are reminders of the past. And just outside 
uh, Krakow, there's a, a place called uh, Nova Huta, which was this giant new town that the Soviets built to house 100,000 steel workers. They built it in a, in a very few years. And that's quite a spooky place. It's, you know, socially socialist, realist architecture, sort of a vision of their heaven, a lot of people's hell, if you like. And that was to serve the, the VI Lenin, Lenin uh, steelworks. And similarly in uh, the other place, perhaps my favorite place in Poland is Gdansk which is the uh, Baltic seaport. And again, this great mixture of beautiful ancient history there that has Hanseatic architecture, which you see all down the coast, right down to Amsterdam. Very beautiful, curvy tops to the buildings, a lovely river leading out to the sea, medieval architecture, fabulous cathedral. And then you come across the shipyard gates, which have been preserved, and that's where... People will perhaps remember where the Gdansk uh, shipyard strikers led by Lech Walesa kind of led the uprising against communism from the, from the late 70s up until 1989 when they won democracy. And there's an absolutely terrific museum there as well that, that, that does the, covers the communist past and the impact of communism on Poland very well. So, yeah, I, I, love, I love that about the place, how it combines the old and the new. Mm. Yeah, so it's amazing when you talk about that. And I think uh, many people, when they think words like communism and, you know, the Iron Curtain and Eastern Europe, I mean, you, you think people have the colour kind of grey in their head a lot of the time. Yeah. Um, but the, what you're describing there sounds a lot more colourful. You know, it, did you feel that sort of it's a lot more alive than perhaps it would have been back in the, back in the 80s, back in that time? It's funny you should say that because... When I went to Gdansk the first time with my husband, I said to him, well, look, you know, you are Janusz, you're that age. What's it like coming, coming back here? And he said exactly that. He said, what I remember is a complete lack of color. Mm -hmm. The only color you saw in the streets was the occasionally outside a, you know, an official building, the, the red flag of communism or the, or, the, or, the Polish, or the Polish flag at the time. Um, and he says now that it's absolutely filled with colour because it's like every other Western European city. Mm. Of course, that comes with a downside. And when Janusz goes back to Poland, he bemoans the fact that, you know, his generation and generations before his fought for freedom and now the young people, what they're interested in is, you know, McDonald's and Ikea and, you know, the kind of materialist <laughs> <Facebook>. side. Facebook. <laughs> yeah, the materialist side, if you like, of, of the kind of Western European and, and American dream. And, you know, she, Natalie says to him, well, that's freedom, you know, people get to choose what they want. Mm. Yeah, it's really true. My my husband's family is from um, uh, Budapest and Hungary, and yeah, visiting there, very similar kind of feeling. And also the fact that you still you see the the people who were there in the eighties; these people are still alive, you know. And the people who perpetrated things that you know, this is not ancient history, is it? That's what's so amazing. Yeah, no, I, th that's what I think so interesting. I mean, the books only obviously they're not all about that. The first mm. book has quite a lot of Janusz's past in it, but. It's something that's part of his character because he's grown up with it. And part of the kind of push-pull with him and the British cop, Natalie, is that you don't trust the cops when you've been brought up under communism. So their anti-authoritarian streak, or, you know, I'm generalizing, but for a lot of Poles, this anti-authoritarian attitude goes very deep. Mm. And of course... This is one of the reasons that uh, Polish people came to Britain and still come to Britain because there's fr much more f freedom here and, you know, m many more opportunities. And like you said, I know a lot of my hairdressers Polish and, and that the workmen outside are Polish because they really are the best builders, right? I mean, they, they really do most of our building now here. Yeah. But this, this issue of immigration right now, both in America and Europe, is very uh, like a hot topic. And yet, you know, I don't like with our marriages, we're obviously obviously married into Eastern Europe. Um, but do you do you kind of cover the issues of immigration? And what do you think uh, the Polish people in Britain now think about this? I, I always kind of hesitate about 
generalizing or try I mean obviously I can't be a mouthpiece of Polish people I you know I'm not even Polish I think that there is an increasingly uh, hostile attitude to immigrants migrants in general in this country and that's that's a shame to see and I have heard some Polish friends say they feel less welcome here than they did originally I've also heard some of them say on the other hand, with four million new people in the country, we can sort of understand why some people who maybe had jobs and, you know, are in the same trades and now competing with lower priced Polish tradesmen can understand their point of view. But I think the important thing is, is that when it comes to prejudice, to xenophobia, the important thing is to understand other people. I mean, it sounds very trite, but it is absolutely true. Lots of people who may just kind of dismiss Eastern Europeans as one sort of block and, you know, they're like this or like that. I hope that in some small way when they read the books and they get a bit more of a grip of what Poland's like, it's not just another Eastern European country that's emerged from behind the Iron Curtain. This is a country that used to be at the heart of Europe. Um, you know, alongside France and Germany. Uh, and I hope that by an understanding of all that and just a knowledge of the culture of what they eat, what they do, what they like to do at Christmas, that things become a bit less scary when you know them. Uh, but I'm never, ever into sort of tub thumping about it. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's important. I think it's kind of, there's a kind of, bigotry almost in in being the other way in sort of pushing it down people's throats and going you must like immigrants and, and that that's almost insulting to the polls you know I, I happen to be writing books that feature some people from the Polish community and other immigrant communities in the UK uh, they're not there to demonstrate uh, you know my views or to say you've got to like these people Mm. I just happen to write about another culture. Yeah, and I mean, I, I have characters in my books, like I have a, a, a half Nigerian character. My sister-in-law's Nigerian, you know, I'm married to a Hungarian. I've got a Canadian in my family. We're all just all over the place. And I, I think that's what's great about London, really, isn't it? And, you, you know, you're a Londoner too. Our city is full of people from all over the world, and that's what makes it so rich. Absolutely. Absolutely, and, and where else would my husband get all his Polish food if it wasn't for those <laughs> Polish jobs? <laughs> well, well, there's another question. What is your favourite Polish food? Um, my favourite Polish food is probably bigos, which is the national dish of Poland, and it might sound to non-Poles a bit horrible because it does feature quite a lot of sauerkraut and I'm not a fan of sauerkraut generally but it's all cooked down in an amazing stew with lots of game and pork ribs and flavorings and it's absolutely delicious. Well that sounds good. <laughs> so Mate. So I also wondered, um, you know, about the, you know, you, in your writing in general, what are the themes, obviously Poland and, you know, is one theme, but what are the other themes that come up in your writing that you revisit over and over again? Yeah, I, I suppose I write about Poland because I do like the idea of outsiders, writing from the outsider's point of view. And I found it, more liberating in a way, you know, I could have, in fact, I'm writing at the moment a different book that's from the point of view of a kind of middle-class, middle-aged professional woman in London. Ah. <laughs> Who would that be? <laughs> yeah. But that's actually much, much harder than writing Janusz Kiszka. There's something about putting yourself, you know, all, right, all we writers have to do this, put ourselves in someone else's shoes. And there's something much more, I don't know, it's much more rich, much more liberating to do that so I do like to put myself in someone else's shoes I like the point of view of an outsider and even with Natalie who's a Londoner she's kind of she's a bit of an outsider in a man's world you know it's only quite recently that women have been rising up the ranks uh, as police detectives so she particularly early in her career has had has had some struggles with that I do I do like I like that the outsider view mm. Um, I guess the other thing, and this is probably a, this is probably 
perhaps why I was drawn to having a Polish hero is that I like exploring ideas of kind of honour, if you like, um, what it is to be an honourable person. And very often in the books, Janusz frequently, I mean, he's a, he's a kind of mixture. He's, a, he's an educated man. He's quite a sensitive soul in many ways. He likes to cook. But on the other hand, he's quite happy to dish out some judicious violence to the bad guys. Um, and so he has a code of honour a very strong one, if it's if a distinctive one, and uh, I often have him come up against moral dilemmas where he has a choice between doing the right thing and doing the comfortable thing, and I think that's particularly true in the third book where he has a really, really tough dilemma at the end. Mm. Okay, now you have a really interesting day job. You're a TV producer, which is like really, really exciting. As well as a writer, you had to have this brilliant life. <laughs> So um, tell us, how does your work in TV influence your writing and vice versa? I guess there's two, two main effects of being, I was a journalist first and then I became a TV director and producer and now I'm still a TV producer part time, but I pretty much drive a desk these days. Um, and I think the two things that have spilled over into the writing is first and foremost, the journalism, the research. I'm very... I am very inspired by real world events, by the research that I do. So I don't do the research just so I can go, oh, that's correct. Um, I genuinely am inspired by reading all those books about Poland and whatever subject it, it is I'm researching, I kind of know it backwards. And I find that's really a rich, rich source of story ideas and twists and turns in the story. So that's, that's one way I'm, I'm kind of good at becoming an armchair expert pretty fast. And the other thing I think is that lots of people have said very kindly that they they think the books are very visual, they're very cinematic. Um, and I think that is a result of, of me having been a director, or maybe I was a director because I've always had a very strong visual sense. And I always start my books, my scenes, my chapters, everything by seeing it. I don't start with the words and then, you know, I start with seeing it in my head and then I then I do the hard work of getting it down. But I'm always really keen to choose places that, that I can strongly visualise. So, you know, whether it's Janusz beating up some guy on a snowy nighttime airport on the edge of eastern Poland or chasing, being chased through the Greenwich foot tunnel under the Thames, uh, or, you know, I love to find very evocative, very visual settings um, and as I say, it's just the way I think. It's not, haven't been thinking, hmm, I wonder if this can become a film. Um, although happily, I, I, I have to say the BBC has optioned the, the series as a possible drama series. So who knows, everything crossed. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, and no, I'm, I'm exactly the same. I, I actually get all my inspiration from places and research. So I think there's some of us who do it that way. And then there's other people who kind of come from the other angle, aren't there? Right, so, absolutely. There's, yeah ways different ways of writing yeah so what other thriller authors uh and books do you love to read or that you're reading right now gosh i mean there's so many it's really hard to boil it down um the last thing i read which was absolutely fantastic is slightly off slightly at left field um was a book called the bees by i think it's Leilene paul is her name and it's set in a hive of bees and the heroine is a worker bee wow. sounds just extraordinary but somehow she pulls this off and it, it's basically a thriller but with all the kind of rules and the science of how bees operate but with a obviously a newly imagined inner life and it's absolutely brilliant uh, a really gripping thriller and and one of those books where I really learned something about bees and I now know the right plants to put in my garden to encourage the bee population. So that, that was, that's my most recent hit, if you like. Um, I read uh, in the UK, the names that come to mind would be uh, Ian Rankin is my absolute hero and Val McDermid as well. I also read quite a lot of European crime fiction uh, in France, I like French crime fiction. I like Fred Vargas, who's actually female, and uh, Alex Lemaitre, 
who mm-hmm. won the uh, International Book of the Year a couple of years ago with a fantastic book called Alex. And I can't not mention, of course, a Polish writer, uh, Zygmunt Milosiewski, is uh it's becoming a new genre i mean crime i think under communism crime sort of went to you know they didn't have crime fiction in poland they had enough going on Mm. but now it's it's kind of you know democratic society they're getting a bit more like the rest of western europe crime fiction is a really burgeoning genre and he's he's probably one of the top guys zygmunt milishevsky Oh, that's, that's, that's brilliant. Some really new names there for people to have a look. And I mean, do you think that, I mean, we have a lot of crime fiction in the UK and we have one of the safest, nicest kind of countries with very little violence. Do you think that's why it's now emerging in Poland and some of these other countries that as soon as your country becomes more settled, you start writing violent things? <laughs> I definitely think that crime fiction is is a product of a very settled society. I think that if we try and understand why people are so keen to read crime fiction, I think it's to do with the bogeyman, essentially. And I think going right back to when we sat around fires in the mouths of caves and told each other stories about the saber-toothed tiger and the, you know, and the storms and the spirits and the devils that were out there, we, you know, we want to sort of make the threats. We want to ex- look at the threats, dramatize the threats, and then overcome them in some way or come to some resolution with them and I think that's what happens in crime fiction that we still have these fears our fears are now just different and yeah absolutely we don't there are very few things to fear in a modern developed society but there's something in us there that still you know when the lights are all off at night in your home it's not a saber-toothed tiger but it might be you know a serial killer coming knocking at your door so there's something about us that still has that atavistic fear of of the bogeyman of the of the outside and i think the crime fiction in all its forms is a way of sort of coming to terms with that Mm. so what's coming next uh from you you mentioned a bit about this new book is that that what we can look forward to next uh, yeah, I'm trying my hand at a standalone at the moment. Uh, three uh, Janusz books uh, in the bag. And I think it's, an, it's a good time to refresh my brain a bit and go do something else. And it is really, really difficult after doing a series where I just pull my characters off the shelf and say, hey, Janusz, what are you up to now? Uh, I'm having to invent characters from scratch. It's it's a really, really tough process, actually. So I've kind of promised myself that while I'm doing it, I'm probably also going to do a Kindle single or, you know, a, a short that perhaps takes Janusz and his best mate Oc- Oscar, who have such a laugh together, and maybe take them on a road trip to Poland on a short adventure to keep my hand in. That sounds like fun. <laughs> and of course, you'll need a research trip to do that. <laughs> brilliant so where can people find you and your books online so my website's annualipska.com there's all the links and information about me there the books in the uk are available through amazon and all the other uh, e-outlets and in the shops at waterstones and various independents and in america at the moment it's only amazon.com but i'm hoping that it will be available as a print book and other outlets soon Brilliant. Thanks so much for your time, Anya. That was great. It's been a great pleasure. Thanks for having me.